I work here at Cornell at the vet school. I've been a radiologist here since September 2015. Um, and previously to that, I have, have worked uh, back in the UK, but over also in California. Um, and uh, it's uh, been really fun putting this lecture together. This isn't my normal lecture uh, uh, topic, so it's been really interesting. Um, so my you've got two lectures from me this morning. The first one I'm going to talk to you about um, neglect and cruelty and the radiologist's role in that. Um, and it's particularly um, um, working as a radiologist both in a hospital but also as a teleradiologist. Um, it's quite interesting because you can get I I images sent to you from an anywhere and we actually get quite a nice overview of cases and of animals that might have seen multiple doc doctors from different hospitals that might slip through the cracks and the radiologist gets everything t in front of them. So that's quite interesting to, 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 uh, 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 to be a part of. Um, and then I'm going to go and talk to you about the imaging features of specific conditions that we see in association with neglect and, neglect and abuse. And then the next lecture is going to go on and we're going to talk about uh, case examples. So I've got a, a few cases to go through. So I, I uh, did a little uh, internet search about our, our role as uh, radiologists in abuse and neglect. And this came up from the, the uh, Royal Society of um, uh, uh, radiological, radiology Society, um, and this is uh, uh, the headline that, that, that I came up with, and that radiology can play a critical role in the diagnosis of child abuse, this is in human, human medicine. And this is because um, we, we can get a very sketchy hitch history from owners, we, uh, slash parents, um, and, <laughs> uh, and, and sometimes it's not until we get a CT scan and we can see multiple different fractures of different ages on that CT scan that we start getting an in uh, a concern for abuse in certain cases. So uh, this was a very interesting article that talked about um, the fact that imaging often uncovers the first evidence of neglect or abuse in children, and, and it's the same would stand for, for animals. Um, uh, we can see chronic fractures at different stages of healing. Uh, we can see some malnutrition-associated bone lesions. Um, we can see classic patterns of abuse, so uh, multiple uh, animals coming in multiple, uh, with multiple fractures over time. Um, animals that have uh, 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 suspicious hematomas and things like that uh, going on in, in their imaging. Um, multiple uh, visits for, by different physicians. So some, we can get all of those images together and put them together, together and see that, okay, Dr. So-and-so from this hospital saw, saw, saw him on this date, and then on, on this date it was a different, different doctor, and, and trying to get, put that together as, uh, under the same hat and, and realizing these animals um, are undergoing abuse. Um, imaging can also rule out abuse because sometimes we can have multiple fractures um, and it's not because an owner's done anything uh, abusive that we've actually got an animal predisposing to fracture. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, I'm just going through again, as I mentioned, often we have an unclear, unclear or, or no clinical history and it's a diagnostic challenging, uh, challenge to understand the extent of injury or disease present um, because we're not, we're not entirely sure um, what, what's gone, in, uh, gone on in the past. We have several options for imaging. Um, we, can, we do radiographs. This is a good standard overview uh, that we can get from, for, for, for a case. Their uh, radiographic uh, uh, x-ray machines are in most practices, and it really gives us a nice overview of the skeletal system and, and general organ size. So we can get an overview of whether we've got blood in the abdomen, whether we've got uh, fractures. We can also use radiographs to evaluate open wounds and perform something like a fistulogram, um, which I'll talk to you a little bit about, about later. Um, so we've got a, a, a few options with, with radiographs to, for evaluation, particularly of fractures, um, but also uh, skeletal um, opacity um, and uh, general overview of thorax and abdomen. Ultrasound's the best option for assessing abdominal diseases and soft tissues. So really helpful if you've got a swelling and you want to know what's going on. You've got a swollen eye, you want to see that globe is intact. If you've got an, uh, an abdomen, we, uh, an animal that's, that's, that's bleeding, and we want to see where that's coming from, ultrasound is a really nice uh, uh, technique for that. CT is a really, uh, uh, is it sort of the next step up. CTs are more expensive, however, they can be done under sedation, and they ca it's a relatively quick procedure, and we can get a whole body overview uh, of, the, uh, 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 of, the, uh, of the skeletal system and, and, and uh, uh, evaluate multiple sites. CT is excellent at looking at thorax as well, and we can get a really nice uh, assessment of what's going on. And MRI, we usually employ that when we've got signs of head trauma or uh, other neurological disease that we want to get to the bottom to. It, employed less commonly uh, unless we've got a, a particular concern for neurological disease. 
So I'm going to start off and go through some radiographic features of different uh, uh, different cases we might see in, in abuse and neglect cases. The first one is starvation. So fat has a reduced opacity going compared to the organs in the abdomen. So we have a renal silhouette uh, uh, visible here. This is the, 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 the liver coming down. Here we've got these loops of intestine. This is a normal abdomen in a normal, uh, normal weighted dog. When we have loss of fat due to starvation, we get loss of uh, serosal detail. So we lose the margins between the intestines and the uh, adjacent organs because the fat just disappears. Um, another thing to, uh, to realize is these animals also have a tucked up abdomen. Can you see how we've got this conve uh, sorry, concave appearance of the abdomen? That's very important because you can get loss of serosal detail for other reasons. There's a tucked up appearance. So this is an, an abdomen that has lots of serosal detail, but this is because of effusion. So fluid is surrounding the organs, and that fluid has the same opacity as, as so, so water and liver have the same opacity. Um, so we will lose serosal detail secondary to, to effusion. But can you see how he's got a pendulous abdomen rather than a tucked up abdomen? So making sure that you've got lots of serosal detail and a tucked up abdomen is also important. And remember, um, puppies will have a very poor serosal detail too because their fat is a different cons uh, con uh, is, has a different opacity to an adult animal. So, so puppies um, will, ha will have uh, a reduced uh, serosal detail, um, but also effusions. Um, other signs of, of uh, 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 chronic uh, um, uh, starvation, uh, including uh, include an undulating skin margin of the spinous processes, so you will lose all the subcutaneous fat. So the skin will just, as you can palpate and visibly see on the animal, you'll see a, a margin over the spinous processes. And we uh, animals that haven't been fed for a long time won't have any gastric content. So this is a case um, we've got no stomach uh, stomach f uh, food in the stomach, no no feces, well only a very small amount of feces in the colon, and nothing uh, very empty looking intestinal tract, just because they they've got nothing going through. And then chronically they can also get um, skeletal opacity issues so so they can start looking a bit their bones can start looking a bit loose and just just due to chronic uh, 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 chronic uh, malnutrition moving on to malnutrition these little guys really suffer unfortunately so um, we're going to talk to you a little bit about um, a very very common uh, mismanagement of, um, of of disease in particularly in, in, in reptiles, and that's when we have nutritional hyperparathyroidism. Generally in reptiles, it's, it's a kind of a, a combination of a few things, um, predominantly due to a low calcium diet, particularly animals fed crickets and mealworms. Um, this is a, a, a bearded dragon, and his uh, skeletal opacity, this is uh, a, a guy with nutritional hyperparathyroidism, and this is his, what they should normally look like. So you can see, we can barely see his skeleton. And when I look at these guys, I ha always have the, the conversation with myself radiographically is, can I see his toes? If I can't see his toes, then his skeletal opacity is too, is too weak. And I, this guy, I can see just the soft tissue in his toes and not his bones. Diffusely uh, loosened skeletal system. And as a consequence of that, these guys will stop walking, stop um, moving around because they have multiple chronic <coughs> folding fractures, extremely painful. Um, uh, and and, and uh, life-ending condition. Um, some uh, owners can be quite uh, doing well with the calcium in their diet, but they can also uh, have these other factors that can be contributing to it. So they might have parasitism, cold ambient temperature, they're not moving around um, enough, um, or, a, or a low uh, UVB. So these are all, can all contribute to uh, this clinical picture here. But ultimately, it's a consequence of um, uh, mismanagement and poor husbandry. Um, that, that results in, in nutritional hyperparathyroidism in these guys. We also see nutritional hyperparathyroidism in dogs and cats, particularly dogs and cats who, who are only fed um, uh, 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 meat-only diets, so they don't have enough uh, uh, of a normal calcium-phosphorus balance in their diet, um, particularly seeing growing animals. And radiographically, what we see is, is osteopenia, um, so diffuse uh, loss of... Um, diffuse loss of skeletal uh, opacity. Um, and this is really visible in the skull because you'll see the teeth really, really prominently because they maintain opacity, and the skull becomes really loosened. And we call that floating teeth appearance. Um, thin cortices, this is a, a, a cat that we saw at Davis. Um, very, very thin opacities and a folding skeletal fracture here um, as a consequence of just complete skeletal fragility. 
um, and, and that's a very classic uh, uh, sign of, um, uh, of reduced skeletal stru uh, structural stability. This is, a, this is a skull CT. You can see how mottled his uh, uh, skull looks as a consequence of just that diffuse demineralization. Another malnutrition that we can sometimes see is, uh, is rickets. This is a consequence of hypophosphatemia. Again, a calcium phosphorus uh, imbalance issue. Um, in these, these, this is uh, particularly in camelids. We see them in, uh, uh, we've seen a few at, at Davis where they're, they're little growing creas. Um, and they have flared and widened physes. Um, uh, and we can see here, this is a widened physes sitting above uh, 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 the carpus here. Um, these animals have a stunted growth. They'll often have an angular limb deformity. And they can be looked diffusely osteopenic. So this is another consequence of just a, a, a mismanaged diet scenario. Moving on to uh, chronic wounds. We'll see chronic wounds uh, regularly in, in animals with uh, collars that erode the skin, uh, hair mats that strangulate uh, parts of the limbs and, and parts of the body, um, untreated skin wounds or bite wounds, um, harness or saddle sores, particularly in horses, and fly strike. Um, and they may be associated with multi-resistant pathogens, so it's a good thing to keep, be aware of. And when we image them, we focus on working out the extent of the injury, because whether we've got um, underlying osseous involvement or uh, uh, seeing how far that wound tracks, it's important to know how we're going to address it and whether it will respond to uh, treatment or not. So looking at radiographs here, um, infected wounds may extend to the adjacent bone. Um, radiographs can be evaluated if uh, to see if there's an active osteomyelitis in the underlying bone, bone present. Um, and uh, these signs of osteomyelitis that we're looking for particularly include a periosteal reaction, um, which is often irregular and interrupted. And this is an example of an osteomyelitis in the, <coughs> in, uh, uh, the calcaneus here. And we can see this uh, lumps of uh, spiculated uh, new bone formation sitting on the, the calcaneus. And the calcaneus has this slightly lytic appearance, so it looks a little bit um, moth-eaten and not a nice homogenous opacity anymore. That's because of lysis of that bone secondary to infection. Um, and we'll see localized soft tissue swelling at that site here. So this guy, this guy has a, a wound right over uh, his tarsus here, and, and as a, a consequence has uh, an underlying osteomyelitis. And that will change our antibiotic choice. Here's an example of a horse that had chronic fistulous withers that were, were, went untreated. And we radiographed the area just to see if there was involvement of the spinous processes here. This is the wound. And this is our thickened soft tissue over the top and our wound. And what we have here is multiple uh, spinous processes of the thoracic uh, vertebral column. And what I'm wanting to look for here is just that we've got nice, smooth uh, 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 margins that we're not seeing any periosteal reaction and those aren't looking too lytic. So we're trying to get uh, a nice overview of the underlying skeletal system here. Another option that we can do is we can uh, use fistulograms to identify the extent of the wound, what it involves. And this is just where we um, pop a bit of contrast into the wound itself and we just see where it goes to. And this can be done under fluoroscopy or just a radiograph. Here's an example of a fluoroscopy. This is a dog that had a, a, a wound on the bottom of its neck here. And uh, uh, he actually has a plate in place here as well that she'd done, had been done about two years previously. So what we did is we popped a little catheter into the wound itself and just started injecting uh, uh, radiopaque uh, contrast agent. And we just watched that uh, go up. And we found that that um, wound extended and sat right around the, the plate itself. So the plate was the underlying cause of infection in this case. But it does give you a really nice overview of how, uh, where that fistula goes to. That sinus goes to. Um, this is, this is uh, how we would do this to help identify the extent of the wound. And we, can, we, we tend to prep the area, place a catheter into the sinus, and inject an adenated contrast agent. If you just have a radiographic equipment, you can do this. This is a horse that had a, a wound, and we just pop that contrast in, and it just took a film. And, and it can, has a similar uh, ev evaluation of, of the extent of that wound and where it's going to. Okay. Imaging features of purposeful poisoning. The big one we see uh, uh, that has imaging features <laughs> is uh, rodenticide toxicity. Um, and these, these are anticoagulants that antagonize vitamin K and interferes with normal synthesis of uh, coagulation proteins. Um, classically see bleeding starting three to seven days after ingestion. Um, and we focus our imaging on areas where we think there is bleeding. So we look at the thorax, abdomen. And there's also other areas that, that can be affected. In the thorax, 
Um, we'll see um, bleeding into the tracheal membrane. We can see pulmonary contusions and hemothorax. So hemothorax is that blood accumulating in the pleural space, pulmonary contusion just bleeding into the lung itself. Abdomen tend to occasionally see heme abdomen. Sometimes they can bleed through their gastrointestinal tract as well. Um, and heme arthrosis um, is uh, sometimes we occasionally see so bleeding into the joint itself. Here's a thoracic radiograph of a, an animal that's had identified of toxicosis. So he's got um, retraction of his lungs dorsally within the thoracic cavity here. We'd, they're not coming down ventrally anymore. I'm sorry, we're a little bit, uh, the, the image isn't uh, showing up very beautifully on this, unfortunately. But we have a pleural effusion, so a hem hemothorax going on here. And what we have, as you can see here, we've got an ET tube coming to this level. Distal to that, we have this very narrow trachea. And this is because these dogs tend to bleed into their tracheal membrane. And that tracheal membrane swells up and starts occluding their trachea. So if you have a dog with uh, suspected identified toxicity or bleeding of unknown origin, and you see this narrow trachea, be really aware that that is a common identified sec secondary thing that we see. And it really brings, brings big flags up for identified toxicity, in particular, having this uh, tracheal membrane. Um, thickening and causing narrowing of the, the trachea. Uh, obviously, that's a consequence for, uh, for, for um, air intake into the lungs, so it's a, a, maybe a, a scenario where you have to intubate very distally to try and keep that trachea open. Here's another example of a redentocyte toxicosis. Um, this guy, he, all he has here, he's got a nice normal wide trick here, which is great, uh, but he's got bleeding into his lung. So he's got this um, low bar sign where he's got blood within, uh, uh, within this right middle lung lobe. So we've got a caudal lobe, which is normally aerated. He's bled into his right middle here, and that mar margin between the opacified right middle and the caudal lung lobe produces this very sharply de de delineated margin called a lobar sign. So he's uh, got a few little air bronchograms coming in here as well uh, that just um, shows his low bar um, opacification. And low bar consolidation is the one thing that's very classic for bleeding. Um, they just tend to fill up one lung lobe with, with, with blood, uh, usually. Sometimes that can be multifocal, but if I just have one lung lobe filled with the, that's opacified, I start thinking about bleeding as being my, one of my primary differentials. Uh, this is another rodenticide ca case. He's, this is a, a patient that's bled into the, their abdomen. We have that loss of serosal detail. And if you can believe me, there is a pendulous abdomen here. So it's not loss of serosal detail from this dog being thin. It's, it's because there's a fusion going on in this abdomen. So this is a, a, a heme abdomen, secondary to rodenticide toxicosis. And this is an example of a joint effusion uh, in the stifle in this dog. And um, that effusion is secondary to bleeding into that joint. So you'll the, the, big si the big joints that you can look for effusion in is the stifle, because you can see uh, we get this swelling cranially that displaces the fat pad here. It's a bit similar to when you see a, a, you know, a cruciate injury. Just an, an effuse, effusion is, is obvious. Sometimes you can see um, tarsi can look a little fused. You'll see bulging of the joint capsule around the tarsal joint. So, but the stifle is a really nice one, delineates uh, effusion nicely. So we can see that is hemarthrosis going on in those joints. Moving on to ethylene glycol. So this is a sweet tasting uh, uh, liquid antifreeze. Um, glycolic acid accumulates and results in acidosis and nephrotoxicosis. Um, and we can get GI irritation, but really the big area that we're concerned about is the renal failure and then the progressive neurological signs that we see. In imaging, we focus on ultrasound because we uh, have classic renal changes associated with ethylene glycol that we see on ultrasound. They demonstrate renal, renal enlargement and a classic um, medullary rim sign. So this is an ethylene glycol toxicity dog here. We have this bright peripheral cortex here. The corticomedullary definition is really, really dramatic because we can see the difference between those two structures really well. And then within the medulla, we have this white, bright stripe sign, medullary rim sign here. And that's very classic for ethylene glycol toxicosis. Moving on to projectile trauma. So in these cases, imaging is focused on tracking the, uh, so we'll start with arrow injuries, uh, bow injuries. I've never seen one of these before. I came to America. We don't have bows and arrows in Britain. Uh, or we do, but we don't, I don't know. They're not as, we don't shoot cats. yeah, we're not, we don't shoot cats often usually. We don't, they're not as prevalent in the general population. Uh, so we, we, we focus our imaging on identifying where that um, arrow is tracking um, and see if we can actually surgical remove as possible. Or if during the surgical removal we're going to 
disrupt a carotid artery and, 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 and have, a, have a major issue. So we are assessing the structures that are traumatized. Um, and CT really is where we go with these guys. This is, this is going to give us the good overview of what, what we're dealing with uh, and what's involved. Um, this is a, a cat. I'm gonna, I'll show you this case later but um, in the next lecture. But uh, this is a cat that we saw. And we can see his arrow is sitting right in his nasal. This is his nasal cavity here. And we can see the arrow just going straight through the bone right here and it breaking that medial orbital wall. Um, this is his eye here. And he's just impinging on that. So going, going straight through. So CT is really the area we, we lean towards with um, arrow injuries. Gunshot injury, uh, see quite a few of these. Um, radiographs are excellent at just showing you the overview of gunshot injury um, because uh, shot is very opaque and just little fragments of metal, so metal opacity that jumps out at you and tells you. Uh, we regularly see gunshot injury accidentally in dogs, with the, you know, pellets in them, and that's quite common, that, you know, the neighbor shot the the dog with a pellet gun or whatever. So the, the incident, incidental pellets are very commonly seen. Um, when we have a, a clear gunshot injury case, we will evaluate that area to look for really where the, where the shot is lying and whether we have associated fractures or other injuries like tracking wounds and, and, and these, these sort, of, sort of things. Here we have a, a, a dog that was shot in the shoulder. This is his uh, scapula up here. This is his glen glenoid tubercle, glenoid cavity. And you see the caudal aspect of the glenoid is basically fragmented into multiple fragments. Humerus has been maintained normally here, but the, the glenoid is, is significantly disrupted. This is unfortunately a, a, an articular fracture uh, and will uh, um, be a, an issue for the dog in the future just, just due to the normal articulation will be lost in this case. But you can see these uh, multiple metallic fracture fragments of secondary to the, where the bullet. Uh, this guy also had some tracking gas extending uh, the wound was sort of auxiliary, uh, and, and gas tracked into the wound and along the, um, uh, under the arm and along the thoracic wall here. We need to make sure that the gas isn't tracking into the, uh, into the thoracic cavity and causing him a pneumothorax or, or a pneumomediastinum. So, so looking for uh, other sites of uh, trauma or tracking of gas into areas that could cause the, the animal um, significant progressive uh, deterioration. Um, so radiographs give us a nice overview. However, CT really is, um, again, a, a fan fantastic way of getting a complete overview, particularly when you've got um, a guy like this, um, where we have multiple uh, uh, sites of injury. This is uh, shot. He was shot in the face. Um, and this is our, just our scout image on CT. So you can see how many um, uh, sites of concern are, are present here. Um, and, and also helpful if you've uh, CTs are also helpful if, you've got, if you're concerned for a complicated fracture associated with the trauma because it'll give you a really nice overview, particularly in skulls and pelvises and things, which are a bit more challenging to evaluate on radiographs. So this is his CT scan. And so you can see um, on CT the uh, uh, those little. Um, uh, bullets cause what we call beam hardening artifacts. They sparkle um, on CT, um, and they can distort the local um, region that they're, they're sitting in. Um, but it, this does give us an overview of these, uh, those sites of concern. Um, so here we have um, the, the sort of caudal nasal cavity. This is the frontal sinus. This is his cribriform plate and, and his olfactory lobe. And we've got one, two, three fragments of... Um, uh, of, of shot just next to his uh, brain here. And then back in his ol uh, olfactory region, we have um, a, uh, a small shot right in the brain there. So, so these are areas that we're concerned about, that has he got brain trauma? And then you can also look, okay, have we got something close to the carotid artery, something that needs removed? Um, so it, this gives us a really nice overview of, of uh, sites of concern and, and, and whether we need to go and remove or whether we're going to expect brain edema, whether we're going to expect, um, uh, could, should, sh sh do we have any active brain hemorrhage going on with secondary to this? So this CT gave us a lot of answers as to where everything was lying and what, what was going on. Moving on to imaging features of blunt trauma. So ultrasound is our optimal modality if we're going to look at soft tissue injury, particularly abdomen, eye and musculoskeletal system, so muscular uh, uh, sort of hematoma, that kind of thing. If you've just got a, a random swelling that you're concerned about, uh, a blunt injury, um, ultrasound is very good at looking for, for, for those lesions. Radiographs, optimal for assessing for thoracic injury and, and obviously 
uh, thoracic soft tissue injury. And MRI CT can, can, is excellent for, for, for neurological injury. Um, so this is particularly when we're looking for soft tissue injury. I'll move on to skeletal injury in, in, t in, a, in a minute. So we can assess the musculoskeletal system, particularly looking for hematoma formation, ocular structures, particularly looking for something whether we do we need to um, do a, uh, can we save this eye or is this an eye that needs to be removed, particularly with globe ruptures. Uh, thorax, we're looking for hemothorax, pulmonary contusions, pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, I'll show you a few of those. Um, abdomen, we're looking at for uh, heme abdomen, so bleeding into the abdomen. Secondary, often to splenic, hepatic rupture, but I mean, we also see animals that have uh, a vuls their kidneys and, and, and have bladder traumas and things like that. So it's not just heme abdomen, we can get ure abdomens as well with blunt traumas. And then we can look at the neurological system, looking particularly for hematoma, um, intraaxial, subarachnoid or subdural, depending on what, what, where the, the bleeding is. Here's an example of a hematoma I saw this week, actually. Um, this is uh, an ultrasound of uh, the neck of a dog. Um, this is, okay, you've got to believe me when I tell you what these are, because it's an ultrasound. Uh, <laughs> this is C2. This is the dorsal arch of C2. And this is the dorsal lamina of C3, C4, C5, and C6 down here. And these are the soft tissues. So think about nuchal ligament, the um, uh, soft tissue sitting dorsal to the spine at this level. And then we've got this mass lesion sitting here. And so this was a, <laughs> a hematoma in the neck. It was, uh, uh, they tend to be hypoechoic and have these septa coming across. Over time, they can become more echogenic as they contract down. This guy had uh, some blood vessels coming across that, their cervical mass. So, so the blood had dissected around the vasculature in that area. So uh, it, it, they generally just look like a fluidy hypoechoic mass lesion in, in the soft tissues. When we're assessing eyes to look at um, uh, particularly for uh, ocular injuries. So you'll often have a, a, a dog that comes in that's got its eye closed, it's all swollen, and it's quite hard to assess uh, whether this eye is savable, what's, what's going on. And I love ultrasound for this. And, and just you know, practice on, this is my dog actually. I, I wrote a chapter and I scanned his eyes for it. Um, but he, um, it's, it's quite helpful because I have a baseline image and he now has like nuclear sclerosis, a bit of cataract formation, he's getting older. Anyway, uh, so eyes and ultrasound really work well together. To pop your ultrasound on, your, on eyes as, as, as regularly as possible. They're, they're really amazing to image. So we have these nice normal structures, this cornea, we've got an anterior chamber lens connected to the ciliary body on either side. Uh, we have a vitreous here and we have the posterior wall. Particularly when you're thinking about trauma cases to eyes, look for, okay, where is the lens? Is the vitreous hypoechoic? Have we got an intact posterior wall? And is the globe round? The big one is, is the globe round? If the globe looks saggy, it's broken, done. We just need to get it out, okay? That's the, that's the big rule. So this is a, a traumatized eye. We've got a lot of hematoma formation in the, in the vitreous in the, at, the, at the back of the eye. We've got lens roughly in the right place. But we've got a round globe. So we've got a lot of hemorrhage, but this isn't a, this isn't a ruptured eye. And saying that, if he stays inflamed or he gets obstruction to his normous, fl normal flow of aqueous humor, secondary to inflammation, he might get glaucoma and then need amputation. Oh, sorry, amputation. Enucleation, sorry. Uh, this, is a, this is a ruptured eye. Um, so I'm just going to try and orientate you here. Uh, this white line coming here and coming here is the, the wall of the, uh, of the globe. And there's a gap sitting here. And there's material moving out of that gap at this level here. So this is a, this is a globe rupture. Um, and uh, the eye has, you know, sort of a slightly odd-looking non-round shape. So that, that's a classic globe rupture. Uh, you can also see lens luxations, um, and the lens just moves down into the vitreous usually, and just sort of floats around there when we have trauma. So, so good, good things to look at um, uh, to, to assess, um, and you can also monitor over time. Just pop the ultrasound transducer into, uh, back on in two days. Let's have a look. Let's measure: is the globe getting bigger because of glaucoma, or is it? static or are we getting resolution of the hematoma in the back of the eye? Things like that can be really helpful to, to for assessing globe trauma. But ultrasound is fantastic for eyes. I really enjoy scanning eyes. Thoracic trauma. This is a, a dog that was hit by a car. So not really abuse. So I couldn't get everything that were abuse cases, but he was hit by a car. So hemothorax. Uh, this is really what we see pleural effusion. So fluid accumulating on the, in the ventral thoracic body wall. The lungs, as I showed you one earlier, but the lungs retract dorsally classically. Um, and sit in the, the dorsal thorax and become reduced in size. Pulmonary contusions, as I mentioned earlier, classic alveolar pattern and particularly lobar. So this is a, a crani this is a pulmonary contusion here, sitting in a lobe. 
the lobe is retracted down because you've got lots of gas around it, because this has also got a pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is um, basically what, we, what we're looking for with a pneumothorax is this gas accumulating within the pleural cavity. The lung therefore retracts, but instead of retracting, uh, it retracts and then there's gas on the other side of it. Pneumothoraxes don't contain uh, uh, any form, of, they're just plain gas, they don't have any va vascular markings. So the big thing to do with the pneumothorax is to look as to where your lung is extending to, and then if you see gas between, so the, this is an example, this is a pneumothorax bubble here, we've got lung margin to this level and to this level, and then we have just plain gas underneath. So looking for the bronchial markings extending right to the periphery of the lung and through all of the gas space is a good way of assessing for uh, pneumothorax. Also, when you're um, uh, looking at uh, the DVs, remember, if you've overexposed your DV, you can bleach out your uh, bronchial markings on the periphery of your lung, and you can get a pseudo-pneumothorax. Be a bit aware of that if you've got a really contrasty radiograph on the DVs. So just, just make sure, and then just try and win window away and try and make play with the settings to see that you'll definitely have actual gas and not um, just something that's overexposed. Pneumomediastinums. This guy's got a pneumomediastinum cordially here because we can see his esophagus. Pneumomediastinum is where gas tracks along the mediastinum, means that all the mediastinal structures jump out at us, whereas previously they weren't seen. So we'll see uh, the esophagus and we'll see the aorta much better than we normally see. Normally see. But we'll also, uh, he doesn't have it cranially, but we'll also see the, the normal uh, uh, sort of vasculature within the, the cranial mediastinum, they'll all start jumping out. All the individual uh, vessels will start to be being visible. This is this dog's DV. We've got that low bar consolidation uh, on the right cranial lung lobe here. Um, and uh, this is the uh, area that gets prone to burning out and looking like a pneumothorax when it's not. So just be really careful when you get burnt out areas here and make sure you window and look for bronchial markings all the way to the edge of the film. Abdominal traumas, so ruptured bladder, um, splenic or hepatic injury, or hemabdomen are the, the major areas we look for. We can also get involved kidneys, uh, uh, a, a variety of things. So, so bladder ruptures, I like to use uh, contrast radiography. This is a, a case we just popped a urea catheter in, injected, and we can see this contrast leaking out of this collapsed down urea bladder. Um, it's helpful to know where that urine is coming from because you might have a urea abdomen, but is that coming from a ureter? Is it coming from a, uh, a ruptured bladder or ruptured, ruptured urethra? So, so having a, an assessment of that is really, really quite helpful. Uh, splenic hepatic injury, so I, uh, rents in the spleen and, 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 and liver. Uh, you'll have a hemabdomen uh, usually bleeding. And then these, these rents just look like um, they're usually linear, hypoechoic tears in them. Um, and so they're, they're pretty... Uh, they can be pretty uh, well-defined, but I've definitely had a liver that just looked diffusely hypoechoic and was significantly traumatized in edematous. So it's, uh, they, can, they can have a bit of a very variable appearance. And then hemabdomen, and that's just when we get uh, a pleural effusion, remember pen loss of cerebral detail and a pendulous abdomen. And then on ultrasound, we have this hypoechoic fl fluid sitting around the organs that, that, are, that shouldn't normally be there. We can use ultrasound to guide a needle in and take a sample and make sure you can do it blindly, you know, you're happy with. So moving on to neurological trauma. Uh, we t we CT is excellent at de detecting fractures and also for looking at underlying hematoma. So CT is uh, a, a good place to go to. We sometimes will end up with an MRI, but CT is often, often the, uh, the go-to because you can see the fracture and the hematoma. The reason we can see hematomas on CT is because they're hyper uh, dense compared to brain. So this is an example of a dog here. She has a fracture uh, of her cranium under, under here. And you can see on the CT scan that we have this. She, it's a cat. It's not a dog. I'm sorry. It's a cat. Uh, so fracture here. And we can see in the brain itself that we have these hyper uh, attenuating lesions. And that's, hem that's brain contusion, so secondary to the trauma. So CT can give us an overview of those two things. If we want to see the extent of brain injury um, a little bit more closely, MRI will give us that. It will show us the brain edema. It will show us how uh, severe the swelling is, whether the animal's herniating. So MRI is the sort of gold standard for looking just at brain. But if you want a, an overview, CT is the place to go. Moving on to assessment of osseous trauma. And this is really where we're looking for evaluation of fractures. And I, I want to talk to you a little bit about how we assess fractures just generally in, in, in 
in the system and uh, as a radiologist, and, and then go on to, to show you different uh, stages of healing. So uh, fractures, we, we tend to classify according to the following criteria. Uh, we uh, talk about, tra we, we try and classify them de depending on the type of trauma that's happened, their anatomic location, the fracture confirmation that we have, fragment displacement that's present, and we also assess the surrounding soft tissues. So starting off, we uh, have trauma type, I tend to divide them off into periostitis, incomplete fracture, and complete fracture. This is a polo pony that got hit in the head with a polo, uh, uh, a, um, uh, polo mallet, <laughs> it accidentally, not abuse-wise, <laughs> uh, that can happen. Uh, so uh, what we see with the periostitis is just a micro, micro trauma, micro fractures in the, in the skull. Classically, we see them in the skull for, of animals. Um, and what happens is, uh, as a result of that trauma, the bone just gets a bit angry and the periosteum puts down some new bone. So you will just see a small raised area uh, extending off the bone here. Uh, moving on to incomplete and complete fractures. Incomplete fractures happen when we have a bone that isn't, so uh, th that has some pliability. And that particularly happens in young animals. And in this image, unfortunately, uh, my radiographs aren't showing gr brilliantly, but we have an open growth plate here. And coming up here, we have this lucent line. And this is an incomplete fracture of this tibia here. Incomplete fractures, so we'll see them in animals that have the, uh, the puppies and young animals. We'll also see them in cases where the bone is compromised. So is there a, if there's a bone tumor, the bone's pathological. If we have, uh, um, we'll have see incomplete fractures in cases of uh, nutritional hyperparathyroidism or animals that are chronically uh, uh, malnourished or have chronic disease and osteopenia as a result. So, so there, it suggests that the bone is either young or diseased of some kind. Um, when they're young, we call them green stick fractures. Um, when they're older animals, we call them pathological fractures. Uh, complete fractures are the classic ones we see in a normally mature animal with uh, normal bone density and normal, normal bone uh, structure. We then uh, local, uh, classify them according to anatomic location. We say which bone, where in the bone, and then we classify whether they're uh, epiphyseal, and we always sort of mention if they're articular or not, because that change that can affect the outcome. Diaphyseal, metaphyseal, or physeal, and then if they're physeal, we'll give them a Salter Harris classification. This is a, a mid diaphyseal femoral fracture here, uh, as an example of how we would um, classify this guy. We then go and talk talk about uh, fracture confirmation, and that's simple. So just one fracture, no fragments, just a straight, simple fracture. Comminuted, which means multiple frag fragments, or segmental. Now, segmental is a confusing one because it, it's, it's a little bit different to these two. Basically, a segmental fracture is when we have two fractures that are not in contact with each other, and they produce one, two, three defined fragments. So the big thing is that the fractures are not touching, and there's a big fragment between. So that's a segmental fracture. We also talk about the orientation of the fracture. So we divide them off into straight, um, oblique and then spiral fractures. We can also classify them as compression. So here's a vertebral column. Compression fractures tend to happen in the vertebral column. And very, more commonly seen in humans with like seatbelt injury and things, but we, we do occasionally see them as a consequence of trauma to the spine. So we have a uh, normal uh, vertebral length uh, at C5 and C6, and you can see how narrow C7 looks here. And that's just from compressive forces uh, from cranially and cordially narrowing that, significant compressive forces narrowing at these levels. Um, also with these compression fractures, they, this could suggest that there's a vertebral tumor in here as well. So keep that in mind is uh, if you do have a compression fracture in the spine, that, is that bone normal, is that bone healthy? Um, especially if you haven't had a significant trauma related to it. Depression fractures, these are the classic ones that we see when something falls on the dog or uh, uh, sometimes we'll see depression fractures when a, a, a large dog has bitten a, a small dog. Um, this is a radiograph of a chihuahua and we can see uh, the lateral cranial cortex on the normal side here on the left and on the right we have this step happening right over the temporal region here um, and that's, that's a depression fracture at this level and on CT they have these, this appearance. Also see it um, with um, 
horses that have been hit in the head, their sinus, their frontal bones will, will have depression of fractures in that sense. We then go on to talk about fragment displacement. And we did talk about fragment displacement in terms of what the distal most fragment uh, has done. So if we're looking at a fracture of the femur, the distal aspect of the femur, where's that gone in relation to the proximal aspect? And that's how we describe it. So we talk about translocation, whether that's cranial, dorsal, rostral, caudal, palmar, plantar, or medial and lateral. And we'll describe it in those terms. We look at the angulation, um, angulation as a result of the fracture, um, whether, again, we, we, we talk in terms of uh, varus and valgus, cranial, caudal, dorsal, palmar, and plantar. Um, and then we also talk, look, at, look, look at the rotation of the fracture. And I think if we have a significantly displaced fracture, it will really ad change how we decide to, to address it or whether we've, we've got concerns as to uh, uh, how stable a, 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 frag a fracture is. Um, we then uh, want to look at the soft surrounding soft tissues. We want to see the swelling and hematoma. Classically, we will see swelling and hematoma as to do with most fractures. Um, but also we look at um, whether a fracture is open or not. Because if it's open, that means that we've got uh, an inherent infection going on in the, uh, in the bone. This is an example of an open fracture. We've got this, a fragment of bone extending through the, the soft tissues here. Um, and, and generally, if I have a, frag, uh, a fracture that is like within uh, five millimeters of the still, under five millimeters from the skin surface, I'm concerned about uh, open fracture. And I would really go and have a look at that skin surface, see if I can see a, a small wound that can suggest there's tr uh, an exposed exposure of the bone to the, to the periphery here. The, uh, uh, sw the soft tissues are a bit swollen. Here we've got gas uh, tracking along the bone as well. Another big sign that we have a uh, open fracture is gas sitting around bones. It's always important to remember in abuse cases, not only looking for acute fractures, but evidence of chronic fractures from pr previous abuse. Um, we therefore need to be able to age the fractures from their imaging features. Um, and it's important to know if an owner says that a fracture is acute, but radiographically it's chronic, then we have to start thinking, is this owner telling us what's correct? You know, has he had a chronic abuse and he's just saying that you know, yesterday he fell, at, you know, fell down the stairs or whatever else, and that actually we've got a much more chronic situation going on. So we're going to talk a little bit about fracture aging um, and uh, ten tend to see bones that are, are fract uh, fractured from abuse, healing via secondary intention. So secondary healing of bone. And it goes through three phases, which we can uh, have different radiographic features um, and therefore, and also happen at different stages. So you can age roughly associated with which phase they're in. Uh, so the first phase is the inflammatory phase. This is where it's very acute. Uh, we have no uh, remodeling at this stage. Inflammatory phase is um, what, what we see are those acute fractures coming in. And so we've got sharp margins. Um, in those first stages of inflammatory phase, the initial uh, bone edges will resorb initially. Um, and we'll see a wide, slow widening of the fracture gap. As soon as we start getting callous, that's when we're moving into the re reparative phase. This is a young dog. He's at three weeks, and we've got a nice, clear reparative phase going on. We've got nice, thick callus at this level, and we have, but we still can see the fracture line. Okay, and that's that's uh, a callus, but see the fracture line. We're, we're in reparative phase. So that's that's a few weeks down down the line. Five weeks is this dog's already in remodeling. So at five weeks, we have lost the fracture line, but we still have callus visible. So that's, that's what we'd classify a, a, a remodeling phase for, for animal. Can't see the fracture line, but we have, still have callus. So those are the phases. This is a young dog that was in a cast, and he's progressed rapidly. However, instability and displacement and infection and poor nutrition and abuse can all prolong those phases. So it's, it can be that they take a long time to get into a remodeling phase because it takes a long time to, the, to breach a big gap, for instance. So, so it's good to, to, to remember those stages and be able to subclassify. We've got a fracture in reparative phase here. It's not gone into remodeling phase, so we're, we're probably weeks away from trauma rather than, um, you know, rather than months, for instance. So what happens when we have fractures that are not fixed? And you guys, I'm sure, see these all the time. Uh, this is a hypertrophic non-union. This, this is one option <laughs> that the bone can decide to do. And this is where it creates its own new joint, because it just can't heal. So lots of continual, uh, really dramatic, especially this femur here, 
this bone is moving way too much to actually get a, fibro a union with the callus. So instead, it creates a fibrous joint. And it has this very big, thick uh, new bone callus formation. He's tried to heal. But eventually, because there's so much movement, he's just got a fibrous, fibrous tissue sitting in here. If we went in and stabilized this, it probably would heal. We broke it down a little bit. It would probably heal. Um, but if we don't do anything to it, he just creates a, an, an extra joint at that level as a hypertrophic non-union um, and pseudoarthrosis. And then the other option is we can do a malunion. So they do eventually heal. This is a femur that is eventually healed. But you can see how dramatically um, uh, malformed that, that heal. That's not an, a normal uh, way to heal. So we've got a big, thick callus. But he has fused. He's in reparative, uh, so remodeling phase here. And over time, that will get um, uh, smoothed down and, and, and look a little bit more structurally uh, normal. But it'll never be a, a normally angling femur again. Um, this is a case we had in last week. Uh, that came in for a fracture of the femur, and, uh, which is the acute femur. You can see that the very sharp margins here, nice and, and nice sharply angled. This was happened the day before. And we were like, hang on a minute, what happened here? <laughs> He's got this other fracture going on. So apparently the, uh, the one of the children is rough housing. Is that a word? I don't know. Breaking the legs of their cat, basically. Rough, rough housing, the, the cat. So, so we have had a chronic fracture in the femur on the other side here. So this guy, this, this is, I can still see the fracture line. So he's in reparative phase. Still see a fracture line, but have this thick callus trying to form to, to heal this one down. Um, when, you're palpating, when you're palpating, when you're in reparative phase, you have so much fibrous tissue and you know, callus going on. These are completely stable to palpate. They are, they're, they're, by that stage, when they're getting into reparative phase, by that stage, they, they, they've got enough things, stuff around them to try and, to, 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 when you palpate them, they don't move. Uh, so this guy was really stable on this side when they palpated him. This was the, the abnormal side. We did fix this side, but the, this was left to, be, uh, to become a, uh, f a, 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 a malunion. Another thing to think about when you're assessing osseous trauma is, have we got a cause for these fractures? Because there's certain cases where we'll see lots of fractures, and it's not the owner's fault. <laughs> so uh, a fracture can occur with little or no trauma if there's an underlying compromise to the bone structure, secondary to metabolic disease, systemic disease is causing demineralization. So if you have an underlying genetic malformation in a dog, an underlying that causes skeletal, uh, poor skeletal uh, mineralization and poor structure, if you have a metabolic bone disease, which isn't really the owner's fault, or it just, you know, it, it's, it's, it's uh, a... Uh, a consequence of a chronic disease. Cushing's dogs, dogs that are just going to the poorly managed, that, that have systemic uh, or endocrine diseases that, that can demineralize their bones. It's important to look for that. And in those cases, you will have thin cortices, lucent, lucent bones as a consequence. Some animals are also really prone to fractures. Italian greyhounds. We had a dog come in two weeks ago that she, she, she'd jumped off the sofa and fractured one front limb and then fractured the other front limb two weeks later. So, so these guys break their legs just from jumping off the, the sofa and, uh, and they're really prone to it. It's because of their structure. They've got tiny little bones. And so, so these guys uh, are often co not a consequence of abuse. And dyspneic cats, remember, spontaneous rib fractures can happen in cats that are breathing really hard. Uh, so if you have a, an animal that comes in that has asthma, a feline, a cat has asthma, and it has rib fractures, not abuse, probably just a consequence of breathing lots of exaggerated uh, rib cage motion. So this is when imaging can really help rule out the presence of abuse in cases. Okay. <laughs>